بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم we begin with Allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers including the last of them all the blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam as we greet you today on the first day of Muharram, I hope you're listening, the first day of Muharram of the year 1446 here at Finas uh, in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. I want to begin by thanking my dear friend uh, Datu Rosli and uh, the organizers of FINAS for having kindly arranged for me to speak to you today on this subject. But I have to greet you with Shalamat Jalan because we're going on a journey. <laughs> That's right. On uh, the Quran and Gaza's genocide and Russia's destiny. And uh, the lecture is divided into three parts. So, stage one of the journey, I will have to devote some time to defining what is genocide, and this particularly for my brothers and sisters in the Balkans, in Bosnia, in Montenegro, and so on. What is a genocide? The second part of the lecture, we turn to the Quran to locate what does the Quran have to say about what is happening in Gaza and in the Holy Land. The Holy Land is Al Ardul Muqaddasa, and that's not Mecca and Medina. No, that's the land where the state of Israel today is located. And since the Quran says, this is what it says in Surah Al Nahl, Ba'ad Awuzi Billahi Min Al Shaitan Al Rajim. وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبِيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً وَبُشْرَى لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ And we have sent down this kitab, this Quran, on you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that it might explain all things. Did you hear that? that this Qur'an might explain all things. So if you are indeed serious as a student of the Qur'an, you would want to find out what does the Qur'an say about the immensely important things that are happening in the Holy Land and in Gaza. So that's the second part of the lecture. And in the third part of the lecture, we cover new ground on this Jalan. How is Russia connected with events unfolding in the Holy Land? So fasten your seatbelt, Salamat Jalan. <laughs> what is a genocide? Maybe if I speak slowly, it might enter their ears in the Balkans and they might understand. But there are others who have lost the capacity to think, so I can't help them. So thoroughly brainwashed, what can I do? A genocide is not committed by an individual. It's not committed by a small fraction of an armed force. A genocide is a war committed by a people against another war for the purpose of trying to exterminate them. That's a genocide. 
and a genocide did occur in the broad daylight of history when Europe decided to go and invade North America where peaceful people were living for generations and Europe considered themselves to be the chosen of the Lord God. We are the elite of mankind. We were born to rule. We have to teach Malaysia how to eat. If you have curry chicken and rice, you don't wash your hands and eat. No, the civilized way now is to use cutlery. I know Malaysia would laugh at that. <laughs> so they went to North America to exterminate an innocent people there. And they killed buffaloes as pot. An Indian would kill a buffalo and make sure that he uses every single part of that body, including bones. The Indian would not waste anything. But these barbarians who left Europe, that's all the word I could use for them. They say they are civilized particularly on a Sunday morning when they dress up and they go to church. These barbarians who left for Europe to go to the United States, they were killing buffaloes for spots. And in the same way they kill buffaloes, they kill Indians. An Indian was not a human being equal to a white man. He had a status equal to a cockroach. And that's Israel today. So that was genocide, where the entire nation supported the extermination of the American Indians. That is genocide. So Imran, I have to be careful to use the word genocide for Gaza. I have to wait. I have to be patient to see how many Jewish voices will there be? How, mu how much of the Jewish world will stand up and condemn the government of Israel and the armed forces of Israel for what they're doing to the Palestinian people, killing them like cockroaches? That they're not human beings, they're less than that. And if there is a sufficiently large and significant part of the Jewish world which denounces that and makes an effort to put an end to it, then it would not be genocide. But if the only Jews who protest are insignificant, a peripheral amount, and the entire Jewish world supports what Israel is doing then, that would be genocide. So it is too early for us to use the word genocide. What happened in Srebrenica 25 years ago? Was it genocide? The British government wants us to say it is genocide. The British government is always acting on behalf of Dajjal. Whether it is the Conservatives or the Labour, makes no difference. Same old Kruti and Chennai. But what happened in Srebrenica was that about seven or 8,000 Muslims were massacred. Remember, the definition is by their religion. They're Muslims. It doesn't say Bosnia. They say Muslim were massacred. So who massacred them? Did the Orthodox Christian world support the massacre of the Muslims at Srebrenica? That is the question. The sheep and the cattle who have been totally brainwashed wants us to believe that yes, it is the entire Orthodox Christian world which supports it. But I have been to Belgrade twice 
And every single Orthodox Christian I have met, and in particular, the leaders, the scholars, have all condemned what happened in Srebrenica, have all said to me we should find who are those responsible and punish them. And this is why I have said it was not genocide in Srebrenica. But no, these critics of mine in the Balkans will never rest until you start. You must use the word genocide because the British master wants that. So having defined for you what is genocide, we therefore have to be careful in de declaring that what is happening in Gaza at this time qualifies as genocide. It can be, but it is too early to come to that conclusion. Now then, does the Quran tell us anything about Gaza, about the Holy Land, al Abdul Muqaddasa? Gaza is a part of the Holy Land. It will benefit you to have a notebook and pen <laughs> and take notes, particularly if you are people who believe that the Quran is the word of God. In Surah Al-Isra of the Quran, Surah number 17, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about an Israelite people, Banu, Israel. And the term Banu Israel or the Israelite people continued to be used in the Quran until the crucifixion, meaning an attempt which was made to crucify the Messiah. After that, Allah does not use the term Banu Israel anymore because now a division takes place. And it's a permanent division. Banu Israel is broken into two. One part which accepted him as the Messiah. And when they saw him crucified before their very eyes, and if you were there, you would all see him crucified before your very eyes. And if I was there, I would see him crucified before my very eyes. Why? Answer, because Allah says, well, I, can I made it appear like that. I'm sorry, I have to speak in the English language, and I can only hope that my audience will understand what I'm saying, and I'm speaking in simple English. So no, he was not crucified. No, he was not crucified. Let me say it one more time for my critics. I have the world record on critics. <laughs> no, he was not crucified, but Allah made it appear like that. So those who accepted him as the Messiah were weeping when they saw him crucified. And now they are called in the Quran a people who help. Allah, a people who help Allah, a Nasara. As Nabi Isa alayhi salam asks, Man ansari ilallah, who will help me in Allah's way? Qalu, nahnu ansarullah. We are the ansarullah, the people who will help Allah's cause. And that's why they are called an Nasara. But those who rejected him and who were celebrating when they saw him crucified, now they are called al yahud the Jews. And these two combined, who will never be reunited in the future, these two are now known as Ahlul Kitab, who used to be known as Banu Israel. Good. So in Surah Al-Isra, Allah says, بَعْدَ أُوزُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَقَدَيْنَا 
אלא בני ישראל אפיל כיתב, לטוף סידון אפיל ארדה מרתיין, ולתעדון נעודו ואין כבירה טווייס, או בנו ישראל טווייס, you are going to commit havoc on earth, you're going to shed blood on earth, you're going to commit facade on earth twice. Why does Allah use the number two? Why does he say twice when there are three? That's an interesting question that I could not answer for many years of my life. <laughs> The first facade took place after Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam had established the ruling state, Israel was the ruling state of the world that his father had established. And when Nabi Suleiman died, for reasons I don't have the time to explain to you, but there's a book outside on the Jasad, the Jal, the Quran, and the Jasad, and that book will explain it. I don't have the time today. After he died, the Holy Israel collapsed. And uh, an army came and destroyed the Masjid al-Aqsa, that they call the temple. And they were taken into slavery in Babylon. That's the first facade. One of the reasons why Israel collapsed was because they changed the word of Allah to make themselves rich, to do business, <laughs> having changed the word of Allah. In the Quran, Allah had prohibited money being lent on interest. When money is lent on interest, then the rich will rule the world. When an economy is based on money being lent on interest, then money will no longer circulate through the economy. When an economy is based on money being lent on interest, the rich will remain forever rich, and the poor will be imprisoned in permanent poverty. But that is another subject to teach. And Allah had prohibited riba. And they changed the Torah to make it permissible for them to lend on interest to those who were not Jews. But uh, I have books at the back which explain this subject. So this was the first facade, the first time of corruption and destruction. And they were punished and taken into slavery in Babylon. But the last book of two. You will commit facade twice. After they were in Babylon, then Allah gave them the good news that he's going to send someone who will be their prophet. Nabi Isa al-Islam is not sent to the Malay people. No. He's not sent to the Indonesians. No. Tell the Indonesians that for me. He's not sent to the Americans, no. If Allah says something in the Quran, you better listen. And Allah says twice in the Quran, I sent him only to Banu Israel. So when he comes back, he can't come back to all of mankind. When he comes back, he's not coming back to this Ummah because then the Quran will be wrong. The Quran says I sent him to Banu Israel. And when the Messiah comes, the golden age will return and you will rule the world once again, Banu Israel. So when they got the good news that they could return to the Holy Land from Babylon, 
Oh my gosh, there's electricity in the air. The Messiah is coming. And when they were able to rebuild the Masjid Al-Aqsa, there's more electricity in the air. The Messiah is coming. And yet, that's right, he came. They expected him to come and he came. But Allah sent him as a son of a virgin mother. Some of them who had the capacity to see with both the external eye and the internal eye. I don't know whether they taught you in that school that you went to. No, no, no. no. <laughs> All the old boys are here today. <laughs> they knew this is the Messiah. Even though he's born of a mother who is not married. But those who only had external knowledge, book knowledge, you know. You study this kitab and that kitab and that kitab. You pass your exam, finish it. You know a Maulana, you're Sheikh, you're Mufti. <laughs> no need for any internal knowledge, no. No need to extend the frontiers of knowledge. No need for any critical thinking. But Allah says, I send the Quran to people who think. Did you hear that? I send the Quran to people who think. People who dare to think originally. Think critically, extend the frontiers of knowledge to those people. But when you are dark inside, you have nothing inside. No, no, he could not have been the Messiah. And when they saw him die on the cross before their very eyes, because Allah made it appear, they celebrated. They celebrated. And that was the second period of Prasad. What they did to the Messiah. And then Allah sent the first time was the Babylonian army. But he said twice. So the second time was the Roman army. And the Roman army destroyed the state of Israel. The Roman army destroyed the Masjid. The Roman army expelled them from the Holy Land. And then Allah said, in Udtum, Udna. You come back with your facade, I will come back with my punishment. And today they're back. <laughs> and today it's the same facade all again. Even more pronounced than before. So how could Allah say twice, when he displayed it three times. I wish I could leave you with that question. So you would struggle, because I struggled a long time to solve this problem. I tell you that. I struggled a long time. And I, I came up with some answers which I realized now was not correct. The answer is that the first time it was Banu Israel. And the second time it was Banu Israel, Prasad in the Holy Land, mayhem, killing, slaughter in the Holy Land. But the third time it was not Banu Israel. That is the most important point in today's lecture. New knowledge for you. The third time it was a people who have no genetic link, none, with Nabi Ibrahim Elisa. <laughs> the Arabs are the cousins of the Jews, the Israelite people. This one has come from Nabi Ishaq, alayhi salam. This one has come from Nabi Ismail, alayhi salam. So they are cousins. And the science of genetics establishes that the Arabs and the Israelite people have the same genetic links. 
But those who told, control power in Israel today, those who are doing all the killing in the Israeli armed forces today, they have no genetic link at all with the Israelite people. But they're Jews. <laughs> so who are these people? Which is why Allah uses twice will there be facade from Israel. But the third time it will not be Banu Israel. The third time is now taking place now. We now come to another part of the lecture on which I have lectured for the last 25 years or more. I have written books on this subject. And yet, I failed. I failed to teach the subject that I'm now going to teach one more time. I don't know how to explain it, that our learned brothers, the scholars of Islam, all, all, all reject my views, except that today we have the internet. And my view, this lecture will reach thousands of people in many parts of the world. An amazing thing is happening. The, the caravan that is producing this knowledge is constantly moving forward, despite every single effort they are making to block it. The subject is that our Prophet was passing by some of his companions who were sitting talking amongst themselves. He asked, what are you talking about? And they said, we're talking about Alama to saw the signs of the last day. And then he said, in this famous hadith, that the last day will not come until he mentioned 10 signs. Uh, I can count in Malay up to five. Satu, Dua, Tiga, uh, Lima, Impat, uh, Umpat. Uh, five. I can't go beyond that. But there are ten major signs. Number one. And they're not given in the order in which they occur. They will occur. I'm going to speak rapidly now. Number one. Dajjal, the false messiah. Number two, Gog and Magog. Number three, the return of the son of Mary, Nabi Isa al-Islam. Number four, Dukhan, or smoke. Number five, the battle ardo, a creature of the land. Number six, that the sun would rise from the west. Number seven, eight, and nine. Three, earthquakes, in which the earth sinks down and swallows what it swallows. One that occurred, was it in, um, somewhere close to Ulukalang? It was Ramadan and the whole house sank down. Swallowed the whole house, eh? Remember? Yeah. Uh, Taman U UK. Yeah, this was about 20 years ago. Yeah, about 20 years ago. Yeah. But one... Very nearby. Yeah. Very nearby. One of these earthquakes which follow is called a khas, plural khusuf. One in the east, one in the west, and the third one in Arabia. And that third one will confirm the advent of the Imam al-Mahdi. Number 10, that the fire will come out of Yemen and drive people to their place of assembly for judgment. <laughs> So one of these ten is Gog and Magog. Yeah, Jews and Ma Jews. And if we want to answer the question, who are these people in the third facade who control power in Israel today, control the armed forces, and who are not an Israelite people? And that's why Allah says two, not three. If we want to know who are these people, it is to the Qur'an we must go. Because the Qur'an speaks about Gog and Magog. 
אני חושב שזה מאוד גרגן מגג. זה דקמית פסאד on earth. And I've already explained what is facade, that which corrupts to the extent of destroying. And that the facade cannot be committed by an angel, because angels don't commit sin. And facade cannot be committed by the, the, the jinn in this case, Because Gog, Gog and Magog were contained by Zulkarnain, who built a barrier made of blocks of iron. And when he built this barrier, then Gog and Magog could not scale and could not penetrate. But a jinn could pass through the wall. <laughs> so they can't be jinn. So there's only one answer there. That is, of course, for people who think Gog and Magog have to be human beings. So you can disregard a hadith which speaks about some creatures living in the interior of the earth. You can, dis you can disregard that. Gog and Magog are human beings. And they are contained behind the barrier built by Zulkarnain. But they are a people who Allah has given power But they use power to oppress, and they use power to corrupt, and they use power to destroy. I want you to listen carefully now to this part of the lecture. Malaysia, you are capable of thinking. Zulkarnain has power, but his power rests on the foundations of faith. And he uses power to punish the oppressor, to punish the wicked, and to help those who have faith and are righteous in conduct. That's his profile. But Gog and Magog have the opposite profile. They also have power given to them by Allah. And the power that they have, Allah says in the Hadith of the Qudsi, in Sahih Muslim. I have created creatures of mine so powerful that none but I can destroy them. So nobody can destroy them, not even Saddam Hussein. Nobody can destroy them. When Zulkarnain reached to the place where Gog and Magog were located, the people said, can you build a barrier first? to protect us from them. Zulkarnain should have said, no, no, I have the power, I'll go and teach them a lesson, they'll never bother with you again. He didn't do that. No. The reason why he didn't do that was because he did not have the power to defeat them and destroy them. Only Allah has that. So he agreed to build the barrier. When he built the barrier, he said, this is, kindness from our Lord God. But when that time comes of which he has won, he's going to bring down the barrier. And then the promise or the warning of Allah will come to pass. This is in Surah to the Kaf. Nabi Muhammad confirmed that in his lifetime Allah brought down the barrier. In his lifetime. But if you don't believe, then there's something called Google Earth. Ever heard of it? You can go and search for, search for the wall. You don't have to buy a ticket to go to the Caucasus area. You can sit at home and use Google Earth, and you will never find that wall built of blocks of iron. Huh? Nobody. In the same way that those who say the earth is flat. And I say to them, okay, let's go. If the earth is flat, it has to end somewhere. If the earth is flat, it has to end somewhere. Let me repeat it one more time. If the earth is flat, it has to end somewhere. So let's go search for the end of the earth. 
<laughs> no, nobody has ever been to the end of the earth. And nobody will ever go to the end of the earth because the earth is not flat, it's circular. But any spot on the earth in which you check with your, with your measurement, you find it's flat. This is Allah's miracle. Similarly, the wall is gone today. And Gog and Magog were released into the world in the lifetime of Nabi Muhammad now we come to a critically important verse of the Quran which explains Gaza and identifies who are those who control power in the Holy Land. In Surah Al-Anbiya of the Quran, Allah speaks and He says, وَحَرَامُنَ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ But He speaks of a town. He destroyed the town. He expelled the people of the town. He then placed a ban on them that they could never return to reclaim that town as their own. Hatta. Until. Until when? Iza futi hat. Until Gog and Magog are released, the barrier is brought down by Allah. Gog and Magog are released. And when they are released and with their indestructible power, mankind will witness something for the first time time in history and for the last time in history and if it has already occurred and you can't recognize it go back to school a people who hitherto had never walked on the stage of history will now suddenly emerge on the stage of history and they will have power that none can resist. Not even Tipu Sultan in India. <laughs> and they will use their power to oppress and to crush and to courage, to, to, to corrupt and to destroy. And they will spread out all over the world and take control of power in the world. My critics who don't think and have lost the capacity. To, they say, show me the hadith. <laughs> yes. I, I, I feel so sad for them. A people who have power that is unique in mankind, but even Zulkarnain cannot match them, and who use power to oppress and to destroy, will spread out all over the world and hence with even two ringgits worth of common sense. That's all. You would recognize that they would take control of power in the world. When that happens, Gog and Magog will bring these people back to that town from which they were expelled. It was a very famous Islamic scholar from India before Pakistan was born. His name was Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, and if you want to read his book, I suggest to you not only read it, study it. The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam. Read that book. He was also a poet, and he wrote a couplet in Urdu, which shook the whole of India, that all the armed forces of Gog and Magog have now been released. So Muslims, please pay attention to this verse in the Quran. 
in Surah to the Anbiya. That's what he said. So now, which town is it? Allah says he destroyed the town. He says he expelled the people of the town. He said he placed a ban on them. They could never return to that town to reclaim it as their own until Gog and Magog have been released. And they spread out in all directions. Which town is it? If you're sleeping, please wake up. Which town is it? My method to answer that question is to go to Nabi Muhammad because he was sent to teach the Quran. Well, you alimukumul kitab. So what does he say about Gog and Magog and which town is it that's connected with Gog and Magog? And when I go to Nabi Muhammad wasalam, he says that Allah will destroy Gog and Magog in Jerusalem. And so I conclude that the town is Jerusalem. If you have a different answer, let me hear it. You can't say that I'm wrong unless you tell me what is right. Is that fair? Huh? So if the town is Jerusalem, then Allah has expelled the Israelite people. One part of them, he's favoring them because they accepted the Messiah. But the other part, he's cursed them and expelled them. And they can never return to reclaim Jerusalem as their own until Gog and Magog have been released. And they spread out all over the world. So who brought the Jews back to Jerusalem? Malaysia, did you hear that question? Who brought the Jews back to Jerusalem after 2,000 years? to reclaim Jerusalem as their own. My audience today here at Finas is a small auditorium, but it's packed. It's an intelligent audience, many of whom came as, school, as classmates yeah, in that school, uh, Abdurrahman, Tunku Abdurrahman School. Tunku Abdurrahman, yes. Yeah, Tunku Abdurrahman School, yes. Yeah. May Allah keep you close to each other for many more years to come. Who are those who brought the Jews back to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own? If you can answer that question, you know who are Gog and Magog. If you can answer that question, you'll identify Gog and Magog from the Quran. From the Quran. And the answer is that it is modern Western civilization who appeared on the stage of the, earth, the world and triumphed over and took control of the world and every single other civilization is now demonized, <laughs> including the civilization of Islam. And the modern West proclaimed we are the best and we are the last and there is none to come after us. And all other civilizations, including the civilization of Islam, now belong to the museums of history. That's what they said. And so we conclude that Gog and Magog are a non-Israelite people, non-Semitic people, a European people who accepted Judaism and who accepted Christianity and who then combined together to establish modern Western civilization as a Judeo-Christian civilization. And Gog and Magog are those who control power in the modern West. I am 
confident that I am correct and I am explaining the Quran correctly. But my critics are universal all over the world and they are all taking pot shots at me and calling me all kinds of bad names and so on. But I have a message for them. If it is truth, it will survive and you can do nothing to stop it. If this is truth, it will survive and you can do nothing to support, to stop it. Allah will take me away from this world, but there will be students who will continue the work. And so those who control power in Israel today are the same people who control power in the modern West. The Prime Minister of Israel today, I believe, was born in Ukraine. Was it? Poland? Yeah. And many of the people who control power in Israel today were born in Ukraine and in that area of the world. Yeah. <laughs> they are European people. They are not Israelite people. And so now then, we have the Quran explaining to us what's happening in Gaza, that it is not Israelite, it is not Banu Israel, which is responsible for this facade, but rather Gog and Magog. And Gog and Magog are taking the Jews to their ultimate destruction, but they don't know that. Setting them up for their ultimate destruction, but they don't know that. How do you defend yourself from Gog and Magog? Does Hamas know it? I don't like to use the term Hamas. I don't like to use the term Taliban. I don't like to use the term Houthi. I prefer to use the term the authentic Islamic resistance. But if you are in the Holy Land and you do not understand what the Quran says about events and in evolving in the Holy Land, you're going to make mistakes. And they wouldn't listen to me. The answer is you cannot defeat Gog and Magog. Go ahead and try. If you, de if you defer with me, go ahead and try. Whether you are the Islamic resistance in the Holy Land or you're Hezbollah or you're Iran, you cannot defeat and destroy Gog and Magog. No. Well then, what can we do about Gog and Magog? How do we respond to the oppression in the Holy Land? Before I turn to Russia, let me first quote the hadith of our Prophet He said, as only a Prophet could say, that a Muslim army is going to march from Khorasan and it will be an unstoppable army. No one can stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. Iran is part of Khorasan, and today Iran is a free country, oh yes. It's only a free country who could reply when Israel attacked a diplomatic compound, in Iranian diplomatic compound in Damascus, with 300 missiles against Israel, including <coughs> supersonic and hypersonic missiles. Only a free country could do that. Afghanistan is a part of Khorasan, and Afghanistan is a free country, thanks to the women of Afghanistan. They are the best women in the world of Islam. Why? Because the women of Afghanistan gave birth to sons and raise those sons to fight and to defeat the Soviet Union. 
to fight and to defeat Pax Britannica. And just recently, Pax Americana had to put its tail between its leg and flee from Afghanistan. And then Imran Khan declared in Pakistan, that's why he's in jail now. He said, Pakistan, he said Afghanistan has broken the shackles of slavery. That Afghanistan has broken the shackles of slavery. That's why Imran Khan is in jail now. So Iran is free and Afghanistan is free. <laughs> Khorasan is also the Islamic land north of, of of Afghanistan, but they don't play the same strategic role. So that leaves, leaves only Pakistan. The north of Pakistan is a part of Khorasan. And all that now remains for that army to march to liberate Gaza is for Pakistan to win its freedom. But from the day that Pakistan was born to this day, Pakistan has never been free. And anyone who tried to free Pakistan is either killed or put in prison. Let's leave that subject there. So now that we've left the Hadith of our Prophet, that a Muslim army will eventually liberate Jerusalem, not a Christian army, a Muslim army. And when it liberates Jerusalem and liberates Gaza, Nabi Isa alayhi salam will restore the holy state, the Khilafah state, in Jerusalem. Remember, he was not sent to this ummah. Remember, when he comes back, he's coming back as a Nabi. Don't try to demo demote him, eh? And when he comes back, he will have his followers. This is in the Quran. Be careful, be careful, be careful. When he comes back, he will have his ummah. Be careful, because this is in the Quran. And our ummah will be separate from his ummah. We will have the Imam al-Mahdi and we'll have a Khilafah state in Mecca. But he will have a Khilafah state in Jerusalem and that will be the ruling state in the world. But before that, what do we do about Gog and Magog? This is where I will end the lecture. And this is perhaps the most fascinating part of this lecture. I wish I had another one hour to deal with it. I was in Moscow uh, in February of this year, attending a very important conference. And the organizers chose to invite only one Islamic scholar in the whole world, and that was me. They honored me. And they gave me a very high profile in that conference. And when the conference was over, I was, to my surprise, invited to join a small group for dinner with the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov. And uh, he spent two hours with us, and it was a very, very, very interesting time. He took off his tie, he was comfortable, he was joking and laughing, and everything in English because Imran doesn't know Russian. <laughs> and. Uh, all the talk was on politics and economics and monetary economics until I changed it. I said, let's talk about the Quran. Everything became quiet, silent, serious now, no more laughing. And I had to struggle with that foreign minister. It wasn't easy. But at the end of it, he invited me to write a document for him. What does the Quran say about Russia? And what does your prophet say about Russia? And I decided I'll write a book instead. The Quran and Russia's Destiny. I might finish the book right here in Malaysia while I'm here this time. The book is already almost finished. But I won't have the time in this lecture to do all the subject for you. Part of the subject is 
how will Russia help Gaza? The link between Russia and Gaza. You cannot handle this subject without Islamic eschatology. Maybe in this gathering here, there'll be those who have this thirst in their heart, as I had it when I was 18, to become a scholar of Islam, while others become medical doctors and engineers and businessmen and so on. You want to become a scholar of Islam and study the Quran as it ought to be studied. May Allah put that in your heart. Then you can handle the subject. I said to the foreign minister, do you know that the Black Sea is in the Quran? He didn't know it. I said, the Black Sea took us to Gog and Magog. Do you have any knowledge of that subject? He said, no, I know nothing about Gog and Magog. <laughs> when Zulkarnain traveled in the direction of the setting of the sun, he came to a body of water which was dark and murky, Ainun Hamia. We know that this body of the water had to be north of Jerusalem and to the left side. How do we know that? Because our prophet said that when Gog and Magog are released, they will, they will pass by the Sea of Galilee on their way to Jerusalem. And so the geography of this Quran identifies the body of water which is dark and murky to be north of Jerusalem and has to be on the left side of Jerusalem. There are only two bodies of water. The Mediterranean, I hope you study geography at school. <laughs> the Mediterranean Sea where the water is clear, you can have visibility a few meters. And then the only other body of water is known as the Black Sea. Why Black Sea? Because visibility is very shallow because of all the algae in the water. That's why it's called the Black Sea. And many of the Mufassirun of the Quran have identified this sea in the Quran where Zulkarnain reached to be the Black Sea. So the first Karn of Karnain is the Black Sea. Why does Allah use the word Zulkarnain? Why? Karn can mean a horn, and Karn can mean a generation, a people, an age, an epoch. Which one is it? Zulkarnain is someone who possesses two, two currents. Is it two horns? Or is it two times in history? Is it two horns? Or is it two times in history? That's the question. <laughs> Let the Quran answer it. Allah has never used the word karn in the Quran to mean horn. Never. Although he's used the word kar maybe a dozen times or more in the Quran, never to mean a horn. Always a kar in the Quran is a generation of people. And so Zul Karnain is someone who impacts on history twice. The first time in the region of the Black Sea. And power rests on foundations of faith. The second time will again be in the region of the Black Sea. When power will once again manifest itself on foundations of faith. I lectured on this subject a few days ago to the Malaysian Ministry of Defense, the senior officers. And these were all military officers, so this was very interesting for them. The geography of this military force. When will power return? Because it's Karnain, eh? Zul Karnain, 
twice in history. Because all the not two horns. So when will the second current occur? When power will return to the region of the Black Sea, power resting on the foundations of faith, power used to resist the oppressor, to punish the oppressor, and to help and reward those who have faith in the righteous in Kanda. When will it happen? It could not be the Ottoman Empire because the Ottoman Empire was an oppressor waging bogus jihad on the Orthodox Christians. And I'm prepared to answer your questions if we have a question and answer session. I dismiss the Ottoman Empire. It could not be the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union was an atheist state. I dismiss the Soviet Union. It could not be Russia under the Tsar, Tsarist Russia, which preceded the Soviet Union because Tsarist Russia did not have that power. But after the Soviet Union, folded her tent and disappeared into the darkness of the night of history. Mysteriously so. Mark my words. Mysteriously so. Russia quickly recovered her profile as a Christian country. Russia quickly returned to her Orthodox Christian heart. And then something also happened that Allah helped Russia with missiles being able to fly as fast as the twinkling of an eye. Does that ring a bell for you? For those who are sleeping, wake up. <laughs> a missile flying as fast as the twinkling of an eye. Is this in the Quran? Huh? Yes, it is. For those who think, the rest eat their roti chanai and go to sleep. <laughs> but there are those who think. And I am here to invite you to think. My teacher was pleased with me because I gave him more trouble than any other student. I will never accept anything he taught to me, nothing, until I was convinced that he was correct. I would go to him and tell him, Molana, I don't agree with you. He never made an effort, an effort to ever convince me. He would simply smile and say nothing. That's all. This is a teacher. Three or four months later, I'll come to him and say, Molana, now I agree with you. Why? He says, I'm not going to put you on my back and climb the mountain. I'm going to teach you to climb the mountain. That was a teacher. So now, Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam, he asks his court, who can bring me her throne? Bilkis. But that is Yemen. And this is Jerusalem. About 2,500 kilometers. It'll take about two months for a camel to bring it. There were no Toyota Camry in those days. So the Ifrit, which are the most powerful of the jinn in the court, because they're supposed to help Suleiman al Islam, he said, I will bring that throne for you before you rise from your court. My gosh, that is a feat. 
for this jinn to bring that throne all the way from Yemen to Jerusalem. That is what modern Western civilization inherited. Yes. But then guess what happened? You know it, of course. Someone who had the knowledge of the Kitab. He said, I can bring that throne for you faster than this, winking of an eye. Which Kitab? No, not the Quran. The Quran is not a book on aerodynamics. <laughs> no, not the Torah, not the Injil, not the Zabur, none of these can qualify. But it is a kitab. And it's a kitab on aerodynamics. So why does Allah make mention of this kitab in the Quran? Is it only for window dressing? Is it only for decoration? <laughs> I ask the question. Why does Allah mention about this kitab in the Quran. You can ignore it. I do not. I say that kitab is mentioned in the Quran to warn us that that knowledge exists with Allah. We should allow missiles to fly at a speed that NATO cannot even dream of. And when Allah chooses to allow that knowledge to be accessed by any of his servants, the NATO will get a surprise of their life. And it is there in Surah Al-Rahman of the Quran, when you learn to study the Quran as it ought to be studied, you have to study the Quran with more than the rational consciousness. You have to have Majmah al-Bahrain to study the Qur'an. This ocean of knowledge plus that ocean of knowledge, the two must be harmoniously combined. The ocean of knowledge that is externally acquired and the ocean of knowledge which is internally received, and these two must be harmoniously combined. Then you can study Surah to Rahman. So when power returns to the region of the Black Sea on foundation resting on faith, and you can see missiles flying with hypersonic speed, then I know that the second curtain of Carnain is coming. It's for you now to study the subject. And so I now combine to end the lecture Russia with Gaza. That Russia is destined in the second curtain of Karnain to block Gog and Magog a second time. And that is already taking place. That's why the government of Venezuela has survived. When for 200 years, American gunblood diplomacy has toppled every government in Central and South America. Everyone. But now, for the first time, since Hugo Chavez, the government of Venezuela has survived because of Russia's power. The CIA and the Mossad and the uh, Turkey under Erdogan and Saudi Arabia and Qatar, they did a great job in creating ISIS <laughs> and in arming ISIS with state-of-the-art weapons and with tonnes of US dollars and military supplies and so on, and brainwashing these Dajjal warriors to topple the Syrian government and the Iraqi government until Russia intervened. And when Russia intervened, the Western world was surprised that Russia checkmated them in Syria and Iraq. And that's why these Dajjal warriors, they hate me so much. 
And so now, the Great War is around the corner. And in that Great War, the second curtain of Curtain will take place. And Gog and Magog will be checkmated in the north. So no more, no more coming down to Jerusalem. So as I explained to the generals of the Malaysian Armed Forces, an army cannot fight without reinforcements. <laughs> but once the Great War takes place, Israel, that's it. You have what you have, you get nothing more now. You'll have to fight with what you have because nothing more is going to come. <clears throat> because Gog and Magog are now blocked in the north. Not only do you need reinforcement, but you need logistics for, for supplies. And the Great War will destroy all of that. Modern Western civilization after the Great War will become a minor player on the chessboard of the world. And so, after the Great War is could take place, our prophet said, change is going to come to the world of Islam. One hadith says seven years, another hadith says seven months. Abu Dawood said the one of seven years is a better hadith. The seven years after the Great War, a Muslim army will emerge. No government in the world of Islam can stop it. <laughs> None. And that Muslim army will conquer Constantinople. And Erdogan can't stop it. <laughs> I'm so happy with this hadith. And I told the foreign minister, they were stunned when I told him this. I said, the reason my eschatological analysis is that when that Muslim army conquers Constantinople, it'll do so, so it can correct the wrong things done by the Ottoman Empire. So we we'll return, Hagi <laughs> we we'll return Hagia Sophia to you. Hagia Sophia will be returned to those to whom it rightfully belongs. I didn't know that the Russian foreign minister came from Armenian stock, and no Christians have suffered more than the Armenians. So his heart must have melted. He's probably waiting for my book now. <laughs> and so when the second current of con Karnain takes place. It's goodbye Israel. Because when Israel sees a Muslim army conquering Constantinople, and the Ummah of Muhammad and the Ummah of Nabi Isa Islam coming together in fraternity, <coughs> Israel will know the end is close. It is after the conquest of Constantinople, only then will Dajjal appear in human form. Because he's already taken Israel for a ride. And it's the last ride on Israel will ever go. And Israel's fate is sealed once the Great War takes place and the Muslim army conquers Constantinople. That's enough for today. I've given you an appetizer on Islamic eschatology. If you have a thirst in your heart, this is the time. All my books are available outside, but we have a limited stock. You should study my books on Islamic eschatology for what I could not uh, give you in this lecture. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.